Today on Would You Believe It, shop where a nest of flesh-eating beetles make short work of rotting corpses. Hear the incredible story of England's first celebrity crime fighter, who was also the head of London's criminal underworld. See the amazing and intricate historical figures of George Stewart and learn the truth behind an English royal family. Travel to an experimental prison where the ghosts of doomed inmates still linger. Visit the strange, the bizarre, and the unexpected on Would You Believe It? Bones. Every museum has them. Creatures, some long extinct, still haunt us with their skeletal forms. Take a walk around any museum of natural history, and you'll find it's not just dinosaurs that have donated their bones for science. Since the Victorian era, scientists and collectors have been scouring the earth for specimens of everything that lives and breathes. Nowadays, there is still a demand for skeletons, but what do you do if your museum needs the bones of a recently deceased tiger or if your school wants to study the skeletal structure of a North American weasel, where would you go to buy such a thing? New York, of course. To passers-by, the storefront of Maxilla and Mandible is just another window display vying for their attention. True, the items for sale may be a little unusual, but it's not until you step inside that you realize just how unusual. Want to buy a dinosaur bone? Sure, how many do you want? Need a human skeleton? You've come to the right place. The store is all that most people see of maxilla and mandible. Perhaps that's for the best. They'd probably rather not know how these bones got to be in such pristine condition, considering not so long ago they were inside a living body. This is the workshop where the transformation from corpse to skeleton takes place. Those who are squeamish are advised to look away. It is a painstaking process to strip away the evidence of a once living organism. First the skin is carefully cut away. Then the tendons are sliced, relaxing the flesh, which can then be picked from the bones and discarded. The next stage is the most important and is the secret behind getting such beautifully clean skeletons from such messy beginnings. At this point, the craftsmen and women at Maxilla and Mandible have to take a back seat and hand the work over to a far more industrious and hungry group of workers. Beetles. Lots of flesh-eating beetles. Skeletons go into the beetle tank covered with tasty dried flesh. Tasty for the beetles, that is. In this beetle heaven, they are fed a constant supply of animal corpses. It's an all-you-can-eat buffet where there's always plenty to go around. The biggest challenge is keeping the beetle population down to a manageable number. As with most things in life, so it is with beetles. You can't have too much of a good thing. When bones emerge from the beetle room, they are almost ready. A couple of key stages remain. This is the simplest process of all, and the smelliest. Bones are left in a bucket of a special solution so that any morsels of flesh left will be eaten by bacteria. The special solution, tap water. Now the bones are painted with a preservative and they are ready for assembly. This is the most artful part of the job. Arranging the bones in a lifelike manner takes many years of practice. The artist at Maxilla and Mandible carefully study animals in the wild so that the constructed skeleton will be as near perfect as possible. After final adjustments are made, the skeleton is ready. This example is a zebra. Not so long ago, it was running free on the plains of Africa. Now, after it has been reunited with its legs, it will be ready for delivery to its new owner. So the next time you visit a museum and gaze in awe at an exhibit, have a thought for the artists who helped it take shape. But don't forget the real artist who worked so hard to strip clean the bones, the beetles. 
These are the dusty orange groves of Ojai, California, possibly the last place you'd expect to find an 18th century king of England. Behind these walls, you'll find King George III. But this isn't madness. Meet King George. Although not entirely in the flesh, craftsmanship has been used to get as close as possible. His creator, historian George Stewart, has just completed a restoration of this ornately decorated, remarkably detailed, 18-inch high historical figure. This figure, George III, was one of the most complicated figures I ever tried to, uh, to uh, build. George Stewart, who prides himself on historical accuracy, has been creating his figures for nearly 50 years. Every stitch, every chain link has been handcrafted and faithfully positioned. But George III is not George's first. He's also made queens, princes, even deigned to create some presidents. Over the years, he's completed over 200 figures. He started creating them to illustrate a series of entertaining historical monologues. He still performs these in a gallery of the Ventura County Museum dedicated to his figures. Mr. Stewart breathes life into his characters in this workshop. To get the feel just right, each one begins as a complex metal skeleton. He sews simulated muscle and fat around this. Then finally, a fabric skin is stretched over it all. Their heads begin as a skull made from imitation bone, on which he mounts the molded clay face portraits. Layer upon layer, he paints a blend of plaster and talcum powder onto any exposed flesh, producing an extraordinary lifelike skin. Because he rarely uses modern materials, the garments can often pose some unique challenges. When I studied the portraits of him in this period, this is taken from the Ramsey portrait, uh, I saw that the lace on the coronation robe would be difficult for me to find. So I wrote to uh, lace-making firms all over the world, Australia, Japan, France, Germany, Austria. Finally, um, a German firm provided a pattern that would work. But they said I would have to purchase 500 meters before they would manufacture it for me. Well, the finished piece wouldn't encompass more than 10 yards. In desperation, of course, I said yes. And finally, I received box after box of 500 meters of gold lace, which is what I had originally wanted. It took months to accomplish this. The robe was eventually finished. I think it looks uh, very much like the portrait, and I was rather satisfied. Uh, my storeroom is filled with 500 meters of gold lace still to be used. Basing his designs on contemporary portraits and exhaustive research, he is able to instill an unparalleled sense of realism in his characters. After the months it can take to complete a figure, Mr. Stewart likes to take the knowledge of his characters to his audience personally. He and his wife, Carlotta Sophia, Queen Charlotte, had produced 16 children. Unfortunately, they all lived. Um. Tonight he's telling the story of the son of George III, George IV. Everybody's named George in this little saga. I'm, you'll have to keep up. Um, the Prince of Wales was a, a large, florid, rather fleshly young man. He turned very heavy later on. Uh, but he wasn't a man without considerable uh, ability and charm. He was very witty, he was an irresistible mimic, he was lots of fun to be around. And he was a, a young man who was always infatuated with some woman or other. In 1784, the Prince of Wales saw at a theater uh, a very handsome woman, Maria Fitzherbert. She knew the reputation of the prince. She wouldn't have anything to do with him. This, of course, goaded him on, you know how men are. He'd sent her messages which suggested that if she would submit to him, um, great things could be in store for you, madam. Now he sent a letter proposing marriage and saying that if she would marry him, he would make her queen consort. Well, you know, a girl's got to look after herself. <laughs> But because Mrs. Fitzherbert was Catholic, their marriage was kept totally secret. Out of the public eye, they spent their summers together building this, the Royal Pavilion on the coast in Brighton. The extravagant palace soon ran up enormous debts for the prince. He received a summons from Windsor, his father, the king. 
He went up to Windsor and presented himself, and the king said, well, very good to see you, George. Come in and uh, tell us. We understand that you're having a little trouble with your debts, fool. Well, um, I have a proposition for you. If you'll do something for me, I'll do something for you. <coughs> what is that, sir? I will pay all of your debts, and I will increase your incomes if... If what, sir? <coughs> If you will marry a girl of my choosing. <gasps> well, here was the prince. What a terrible dilemma. He loved Mrs. Fitzherbert. He didn't want to give her up. What was he to do? He fretted over this for all of three minutes. <laughs> I'll do it, he said. The king and queen had chosen their favorite niece. Amélie Caroline from Braunschweig. This great, noisy, unkempt girl was to be the Princess of Wales? <laughs> Did this bode well for a wedding or not? It didn't matter. The wedding went forward as planned. The prince was so drunk they had to hold him up on both sides. <laughs> they lived in Carlton House for the next several weeks. They spoke only in writing. And the prince now went back to guess who. Guess who was wheeled out once again, but poor old Mrs. Fitzherbert. So when his father, the king, died, George decided not to invite his estranged wife, the new queen, to their own coronation. Carolyn had every intention of attending. She had a hired coach, a hired coronation dress, and she and her little coterie marched up the steps of the abbey to the entrance. He knew she'd pull something. He had wrestlers placed at all the doors to prevent her entry. Nobody gets in, madam, without an invitation. At that point, they tried to burst through the wrestlers and were repelled down the stairs. Oh, the crowd thought this was wonderful. But as Carolyn picked herself up, she had given in, now she was in tears. She climbed into her coach and went back to her apartment and the crowds jeered her. Well, he was rid of her at last and we cannot pretend that he wasn't relieved. George, by the end of his career, weighed nearly 400 pounds. He was so crippled with arthritis he couldn't get out of his couch. He was still witty and charming in private, but George IV was the most hated and loathed king in English history. And you can see that he had done little to restore the dignity of monarchy. <laughs> By putting as much detail into his monologues as his historical figures, George Stewart gives each one a personality which is very much larger than life. In 1787, in Philadelphia, at the home of Benjamin Franklin, a group of respected citizens gathered to debate one of the great moral issues of the day. They discussed ways to improve the appalling and inhumane conditions in the state's prison system. This is what they came up with. On 13 acres of farmland on the edge of the city, the Eastern State Penitentiary was constructed to plans by architect John Haviland. Day trippers from the city watched this imposing edifice go up stone by stone. They might have been forgiven for thinking that what they were witnessing was the construction of a Gothic castle. This medieval-style facade was actually intended to intimidate, and intimidate it does. In fact, the hilltop location was chosen so everyone in the city would have a constant reminder looking down at them of their fate should they ever err from the straight and narrow. Everything about the penitentiary was revolutionary. When it was built, its $780,000 cost made it the most expensive building in America. At a time when every American, including the president, used an outhouse, and the White House was heated by a wood-burning stove, the penitentiary had running water and fully fitted central heating. All these conveniences, however, were not intended to make life easier for the inmates. Far from it. Every innovation, including the radical radial layout, was designed to ensure no prisoner would ever have contact with anyone else. Seven cell blocks were arranged like spokes around a central hub from where the key guard could keep watch without being seen by the prisoners. Solitude was the answer the Quaker philosophers had decided. Solitude would lead to penitence, hence the name penitentiary.
Keeping the prisoners apart would also prevent the spread of criminal ideas. Each prisoner was given a 12 by 9 foot windowless cell. The doorway was kept deliberately low, forcing inmates to stoop and be humbled on entering. Inside the cell, the only illumination was from a skylight, designed to represent the eye of God looking down on the center. Prisoners spent 23 hours a day confined to their cells, with only half an hour in the morning and half an hour in the evening for exercise, here in the solitary yard. Not only were they allowed no contact with each other, there were to be no visits from friends or family. Even books and letters were banned. Solitude was the absolute goal. When a prisoner had to be moved around the prison, a bag was placed over his head so he would not be seen. Debate raged over whether this was the way ahead for prisons. In the meantime, governments from around the world sent representatives to study and copy the design and method, which became known as the Pennsylvania system. Now there are over 300 prisons worldwide based on this penitentiary. When Charles Dickens visited America in 1842, he headed straight for America's newest and most groundbreaking institutions. An eastern state was at the top of his list. His opinion of the prison was made clear in his book, American Notes. He wrote, I believe that very few men are capable of estimating the immense amount of torture and agony which this dreadful punishment, prolonged for years, inflicts upon the sufferer. In 1913, the experiment was finally deemed a failure. Eastern State was turned into a conventional style prison and continued operating as such until 1970. During that time, the prison held some of America's most notorious criminals, including Al Capone, who spent a year in this cell. In circumstances far removed from those envisioned by the original founders, Capone was allowed to furnish his cell with antiques, oriental rugs, and fine art. Another well-known inmate was bank robber Willie Sutton, who claimed that no prison could hold him. He did escape from Eastern State, but only as part of a group who profited from the work of the lesser-known Clarence Kleindienst. In 1945, an inmate named Clarence Kleindienst was here. He was serving time for armed robbery. He worked as a plasterer here at the prison. He noticed that this wall, the plaster, the mortar between the stones was completely rotten. The cell block was over 100 years old at that point. He made a deal with the guards that uh, they would allow him to sell here if he would fix the cell up. So he replastered it, but against this wall in the corner, he made a panel that looked like it was there. He tunneled two feet into the wall and then down 15 feet, which he had to go deep because that outer wall goes 10 feet underground. He tunneled about 90 feet to come out just outside the southwest corner tower. Paul Eisenhower is an expert on jailbreaks here at Eastern State Penitentiary. The tunnel came underneath this courtyard and came out on the other side of this wall, right next to the tower. It's a distance of about 90 feet. Now Kleindienst did not dig the tunnel all by himself. He did most of the work, most of the digging, but he had the help of lots of other inmates. His cellmate was an artist and made a plaster bust of Kleine's head, which they would put in the bed while Kleine was digging. And when the guards came by doing their nightly rounds, he would the cellmate would talk to the bus so that the guards would think that Kleine was in his cell. When Sutton came out of the tunnel, there were two police officers on patrol and saw him pop up out of the ground. They gave chase and caught him almost immediately. Kleine was captured about two hours later in North Philadelphia. And all in all, most of the people were very quickly recaptured. Ironically, when Kleindienst went through the tunnel, he had only about six more months left to serve on his sentence. He was captured after only two hours of freedom and was given an additional 10 years. So he not only gets a lot more time for having done this, but Willie Sutton claimed all the credit and at least until recently, no one knew that Kleindienst had done this amazing feat. Now the Eastern State Penitentiary is no longer an operational prison, but is open as a museum, allowing visitors to ponder for themselves the penal theories of those 18th century philosophers. What was once America's most formidable prison is now one of its most curious tourist attractions. Where prisoners spent their lives dreaming of freedom on the outside, people now pay to get inside these forbidding walls. And it is only for the ghosts of the men who were inmates here that there is no escape. Would you believe it? 
England has had plenty of crime-fighting sleuths. One of the most famous was Sherlock Holmes, who pioneered the use of forensic detection techniques. Conan Doyle's fictional creation, Holmes, pitted himself against London's criminal underworld and invariably won. A far more fascinating London crime fighter, however, predates Holmes by many years. And unlike Dr. Watson's temperamental roommate, this detective was real. These are the remains of one of England's most fascinating characters, Jonathan Wilde. Operating in the 18th century, Wilde was England's most celebrated crime fighter. He was known as the Thief Taker, and his successes against the thieves and villains who plagued London were legendary. The reason for his many arrests, however, was eventually brought out in a trial that would end with him being sent to his death at the end of a hangman's rope. Jonathan Wilde, it turned out, was not only the thief taker, he was also the thief. And the biggest thief of them all. He was the godfather of London's criminal underworld. Wilde ran his business out of a respectable house near the Old Bailey, England's highest court. His Office for the Recovery of Lost and Stolen Property was practically a national institution. When honest citizens fell victim to crime, they came to Wilde's office and described their stolen goods. Wilde would then promise to track down the items and have them returned on the condition that a fee was paid, of course. What Wilde's customers didn't know was that he was in league with the thieves. In fact, he would plan many of the robberies himself. The system was perfect and London's criminals loved it. Instead of having to sell stolen property on to dubious dealers, who often turned out to be the police in disguise, the criminals would simply turn the goods over to Wilde, who would sell them back to their grateful owners. Wilde was the toast of society. Here at last was someone who was actively fighting crime and making a stand on behalf of the honest citizens, or so it seemed. Yet if Wilde was guilty of double-crossing his clients, he was also doing the same to his criminal brethren. Whenever it suited him, he would make a show of investigating a crime, then turn in a criminal, often someone who had incurred his anger. The unfortunate ex-comrade would then be tried and hanged. Wilde's reign as London celebrity crime fighter ended on February 15, 1724, when he was arrested at a tavern. He had fallen out with one of his criminal employees, who now decided enough was enough. It was time for the truth to come out. Wilde was tried at the Old Bailey, accused of being the head of a corporation of thieves and pretending to investigate crimes, turning in those who refused to share the booty with him. He was sentenced to be hanged and was driven to Tyburn, now Marble Arch in the heart of London. On the way, he tried to commit suicide by drinking loud enough, but he fell asleep only to awake on the gallows, being pelted with stones by outraged citizens who had once trusted him and now wanted revenge. Wilde was hanged on this spot on May 24, 1724. He was immortalized as Mac the Knife in the Three Penny Opera. His skeleton is displayed here at London's Royal College of Surgeons. Ironically, alongside him is the skeleton of a man whose arrest and execution he was responsible for. The man who was known as the Thief Taker is himself imprisoned amongst his old companions, the thieves. Would you believe it?